Okay. All right. Two, three. Hello, everyone. I'm Cynthia Hawkins, gallery director and curator at the Birth of UB Letter Gallery. Thank you for joining us for our Sculptor's Drawing panel of artists whose work is on view at the gallery at the State University of New York in Geneseo. COVID-19 has changed our daily and work lives, which also means restricted attendance to this and other museums and galleries. Hence, to broaden our audience, we have moved some exhibition programming online, which allows a lasting documentation of the art programming at the college. Sculptor's Drawings is one of two on-site exhibitions this spring to be hosted by uh, Bertha Letter Gallery. Today we have with us four, maybe five, of the six artists and each has a different approach to their work as sculptors and to drawing. I'm pleased to introduce our exhibiting New York area artist, Valeria Cray, whose name appears as Sharon Amos, whose work is focused on public art in Buffalo, Lynn Dugan from Rochester, Dan Desarn from Geneseo, New York, Ronald Gonzalez of Binghamton, and Alan Topolsky, Rochester, New York. For transparency's sake, uh, Dan, Roland, and Colin have previously exhibited at the gallery. Now you said, who's Colin? Colin Chase uh, opted not to participate because of uh, uh, working on two exhibitions coming up. So I'm always interested in how sculptors use drawing and their relationship to drawing. But first we'll proceed in, uh, with each of you introducing yourselves for like four or five minutes to tell us, you know, a little bit of your background and what kind of uh, work you do. And um, then, uh, yeah, sort of like what compelled you to go into sculptor and how do you, how does drawing impact your work and what do you think about it? Okay, can we get start with Alan since he's at the top sure. of the screen? <laughs> Sure. Um, I'm Alan Topolsky. I, I, um, when I think about drawing in relation to sculpture, it's, it, I, I don't, I guess when I, I don't, I think about them as making all the time, um, and, and together. So I don't necessarily always think, think of them as separate things. Um, I went to, I came from central Pennsylvania. I went to a state, state school as an undergrad and, um, uh, transferred to Bucknell University. Um, and in those years, I was uh, coming from where art was not a major part in anyone's life in Shimokan, Pennsylvania. That was not a not a thing. <laughs> um, I didn't know it was an option as a as a life uh, commitment either. Um, so um, uh, I was so I was very I was formally trained as a as a painter and and uh, on, on two dimensional because it seemed like a more accessible means of expression at the time. And so I was, I, I, you know, I had private art lessons as a kid, and I, you know, and I, when I went to undergrad, I, I, I had a professor who, instead of telling me how to make art, showed me how to weld and showed me how to use the wood shop and, 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 and make and how to make things. He introduced me to the process as opposed to what was an expectation of the product and that i found that very liberating so i really moved there uh, into sculpture um and uh used a lot of found objects and um i continued my education at penn state university uh, where i got my mfa and i've been and i was adjuncted for about five or six years and then ended up getting in this teaching gig here at the university of rochester in the studio art program and i've been here for uh, well, since the Paleolithic area era, I think. But anyway, uh, that's 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 me. Uh, Valeria. Oh, my name is Valeria Cray. I graduated from University of Buffalo 
and I graduated from Pratt Institute with my MFA degrees. Um, I'm a sculptor because um, I love working three dimensional and working with my hands. I was a ceramic major for a while. I went to RIT for ceramic and then I found out I was trying to use ceramic as sculpture, but my professor kept saying, it's a craft, it's not a really sculpture. So I ended up um, in my sculpture class at UB, I was the only female taking welding by uh, Dwayne Hatchett. And it was interesting because I was so interested in doing welding and learning about fan blasting and all that. Uh, none of the other girls wanted to take it because it was too rough. But I was there with a lot of other men and I learned how to weld. And then I attended Pratt Institute and I, um, I studied sculpture there. And it became very interesting because after I left Pratt Institute, I started doing what's called, um, freelance work for different department stores. I designed sculpture for like Saks Fifth Avenue, Bergdorf Goodman, Tiffany, Cartier. And I worked for other uh, stores, but I would design these pop-up art that would take into the store because I didn't drive and I had to go in the subway. So I did pop-up art for the department stores and it helped me out a lot because I didn't have a job and I had to make money to live. So that pop-up art helped me live in New York and uh, came back to Buffalo because um, I was teaching in the Bronx. I was teaching high school, matter of fact. And then I had to come back to Buffalo because my house burnt down, my studio burnt up. It was, I mean, at the time, it was setting fires to studios for artists because artists go in and fix them up and live in them and make them look really great. And then the landlord would triple the rent, you know. So I, I did a lot of um, fighting against the rent and all this other stuff. And one day I came home, there was no place to come. You know, my family said, come back to Buffalo. So I came back to Buffalo with no art. Most of my had got destroyed in New York City. And then um, Dwayne Hatchett, Jim Pappas and a couple of the artists who knew me start forcing me to get back into my art again and helping me out. I was in shows and it motivated me and encouraged me to work harder towards my art. So as I worked towards, towards my art, I worked with the uh, Lincoln Hughes Center for a while and I was doing uh, shows at the Lincoln Hughes Center here in Buffalo and um, the Albright Knox came by and saw a piece and bought a piece of my work. That's how I ended up being in Albright Knox. They bought a piece called Adam and Eve. Um, I do very abstract, um, very sort of abstract modern pieces of sculpture. So I did that. They bought that piece. And then I was in a show in New York. And for the first time, I sold another piece of sculpture. So I was really feeling very motivated to keep working because I lost so much in New York when I was there. Um, I ended up doing um, designing the doors here on in Buffalo. It was uh, for a uh, Afro um, a Afro uh, library. So I designed the two doors. So you look at the designs now. One symbol on the door says "Welcome," and the other symbol on the door says "We shall meet again." So I designed the piece for this door, and then after that, I start doing more public art. So um, it became very uh, encouraging and I just like what I do, you know, because um, when I'm designing, I have a lot of little Marquettes at home that I design and that I work with. I work with a lot of foam cord and a lot of um, small metal pieces. I have a welding in my garage that I haven't used right now because it's so cold, but I do well little small pieces. And then I try to work with fabricators that I know they tell me how to put things together, you know, to make it work. So I did um, the doors and then I did the archway downtown here in Buffalo on uh, Michigan and Broadway because they wanted something to go with the, the um, I think it's called the, um, the Afro-American Heritage Corridor, Corridor, Corridor. And that, I designed a piece that represent the whole area. So I designed a piece with a woman and a man reaching up towards this, uh, the star. And these are slaves. It represents all, all people that have been bonded and captured and, 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 and been abused. So it's an archery that represents everyone. And as you go through that archery, you're going through freedom all the time. 
Um, I have to represent the uh, the Colored Musician Club, the Nash House, and the Baptist Church, and the area because during that time slavery came through that area. People were leaving, going through that area, finding freedom, and the archway represent all of that. It was like one design had to represent the whole area. It was a, it was a lot of work and it was very hard, but I ended up putting it all together. Um, I basically like doing what I do because it's, 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 it's a challenge and also it's very uh, rewarding at the end. And it's not all about getting paid, but I like creating and making a statement with my work when I make my work, put it together. Um, I draw and I also do small marquettes to make sure that everything is working together while I'm doing something. And um, I teach and I lecture. On my, I did a big project for the medical corridor called the Spirit of Life Tree. And I did a big show at uh, Buff State College speaking on that piece. My son is also an artist and we work together as a team. I'm doing um, uh, big pieces. He's very good at welding and also he's a professor at um, Alfred University. So he's a big part of helping me out a lot of time. We so, most of the time I'm doing big pieces we work together as a team putting it together, I'm so proud of him. But as an artist, as a sculptor, um, it's just a blessing and anointing that I'm able to, to use my skills. All artists are able to use their skills to create something that makes a difference in this world and change people's lives and, and the way they see things and how they, how they feel about things. Because art, I would say art is like dessert. When you work all day, been stressed out, only art gives you a, a piece of calmness, a piece of pleasure, a piece of, of, uh, 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 of, of yourself. Even though you can't do art, but allow you to appreciate art. Thank you. So, Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, can we get uh, Lynn Dugan next? Sure. I. Uh... I actually am a metalsmith by training, um, although I started in undergrad as a painting major. But once I got into the jewelry metal studio, I wouldn't leave. I think part of it has to do with that, that hand, you know, just the making with your hands more, uh, the use of tools. I mean, I just, I just loved it. I did not have a sculpture background. I mean, other than the fact that my metalsmithing uh, professors and my experience in the metalsmithing studio um, allowed me to see things three-dimensionally. I began to really be, you know, to work in space and spatially in a way that I hadn't as a painting major. But when I started teaching at Nazareth College, which I did for 38 years full-time, so now I'm retired, um, I had access to the wood shop. I was teaching 3D design. Um, I had always done mixed media, even as an undergrad in my small metals. So that led me to working with, um, with other materials and working larger. And I went through a stint where I felt like I was uh, repeating myself too much. So in, in the metals realm and, um, so I just quit working with metals completely for a couple of years and I started carving wood. And um, I've been, I've, I think it, the material that I use just is accidental in a way. It's whatever idea I'm working with, I, I look for a material that is, um, that, that will help to express that. So I've, carved foam, I've used animal bones, I've done, I mean, you know, I use a lot of mixed media and a lot of juxtaposition of materials that has to do, and also juxtaposition of imagery. So the drawing for me, um, it, it takes on different meanings. I sketch, I sketch for my sculptural work, for my metalsmithing work. I, but those are usually small, very loose ideas. And then um, I draw to narrate. And I think you can see probably out of everyone's work, mine is the most Good. narrative. 
uh, it usually has to do with some kind of political or social issue. I, I come at everything really from a feminist lens. I think um, what I, I, the first feminism course I ever took was as a sophomore in, at Miami of Ohio. And I was introduced to Lucy Lepard, her work, The Pink Swan, which was, you know, they were essays about women artists. And you know, most of us are of a generation where we were not taught anything about women artists, artists of color. I mean, it was just it was it was definitely um, all you know white male artists that we learned. So this it opened up a whole new thing for me. And and I see feminism as a way of deconstructing power structures of of understanding um, how you know. Uh, where power corrupts, how power corrupts and how power um, allows for this hierarchy in which there are the, you know, the few who maintain power by using the many and um, by oppressing peoples and oppressing groups. And, and I, I guess at that point I'll, I'll quit and then I'll let people ask me questions later on. Okay, Dan. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Dazarn, and um, uh, I have been sitting here trying to figure out what's the most concise way to explain my narrative and how it relates to the um, relationship of, you know, sculpture and, and drawing. And I guess what I've come down to is that m most of how I've gotten to where I'm at right now is just sort of stumbling through situations and then making decisions based on on that. So, uh, I'm originally from Kentucky, uh, Covington, Kentucky, which is right across the river from Cincinnati, Ohio. And I uh, have a gigantic family that still lives down that way. And that has impacted uh, my life and my artwork substantially. Um, as a kid, my grandparent or my, my grandfather's farm that he, that he grew up on, he lived still, you know, within a quarter mile of that. And I spent a lot of time on that farm and watched it turn into suburbia. And, um, you know, which is sort of the story of, of uh, a lot of rural areas uh, adjacent to, to uh, big cities is that uh, it's more um, profitable to just sell the farm and, and turn it into uh, su suburbia. And uh, that happened when I was about 10 years old and it impacted kind of everything, everything, uh, the way that I look at everything. And, um, you know, so uh, as I was about the age uh, to go to college, I had no interest in going to college and I was working jobs to pay for uh, my Chevelle that I loved. And um, <laughs> so uh, anyway, I spent a lot of time working on that car and uh, the, it sounds like we've got someone else joining us. Yes. Yeah. So I, I spent a lot of time working on that car and then working uh, at the time a telemarketing job that uh, was to pay for my insurance. What? And Dan, by the way, I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, nice. Yeah. Fantastic. Spent a lot of time. Yeah, I, I have I have folks. I have Ken down there and also in the Smoky Mountains. Yeah. I went to grad school at UT, so I spent a lot of time at the in Smoky Mountains as well. Um, excuse me. So I, I guess I I'll, I'll can keep rolling. I just, um, so anyway, when I was working at that uh, uh, marketing research job, making phone calls, um, art wasn't something that was really in my mind at all, other than I had all of these things in front of me that I would draw on. And one day it just sort of clicked and I stopped making calls and I just drew for about an hour and a half until my boss came over and asked what I was doing. And um, I said, I, I, I don't know, I'm drawing, I guess. And um, so I got in trouble. Uh, I didn't get fired, but uh, I, I started drawing every day at work while I was making calls. And luckily, you know, the supervisors that I was around, you know, didn't mind it. And there were a few other people there that had, were, were like in art programs. And I said, you should, you know, you should start looking at galleries and stuff. You should think about, you know, doing something with this. So uh, wound up finding like a, a, a little um, uh, artist cooperative that was in, in uh, Newport, Kentucky. 
And uh, some of the folks that were part of that kind of talked me into going to college and it was right at kind of the right time. So I applied to uh, go to Northern Kentucky University, um, found out that um, what I loved about working on cars and, um, and also uh, drawing kind of found a home in sculpture because I was using tools that I was really comfortable with. Um, like, you know, as Alan said, the welder and grinders and chainsaws and things like that. And the beauty for me at the time of sculpture is that, um, well, I guess with drawing, there wasn't an answer. So you were just working on something. There wasn't like, you know, if, if you're working on the Chevelle and uh, you get the fuel pump wrong, then, you know, there's a right and a wrong answer to that. And the nice thing about drawing and sculpture both was that there were no right or wrong answers. And so you could work with the same kind of intensity, but you didn't have to come up with the correct answer. You, you kind of were able to meander through it. So, um, so anyway, I, I, I uh, studied sculpture at Northern Kentucky University, wound up uh, getting an MFA at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville in sculpture. And, um, you know, right after that, getting a sculpture gig, uh, you know, a tenure track sculpture position at SUNY Geneseo in 2003. And um, felt like I was on the path to, uh, you know, greatness in sculpture or something, whatever that even means. I have no idea at this point. So that was a long time ago. And um, sometime around 2006, I kind of came to this crisis that there were all these things that I cared about. You know, I was making art, talking about those sorts of issues surrounding you know, suburban development and that sort of stuff and uh, environmental impact. But then um, I had to come to terms with the fact that I wasn't really working that way. And um, so anyway, I wound up um, one summer, uh, living with my at the time girlfriend um off on bicycles and that was a groundbreaking you know like that was something that just sort of shook me up um in a way that i hadn't anticipated we basically we rode bicycles from uh, geneseo new york to nashville tennessee uh over the course of about two and a half months without a map and just you know lived off of bikes and and that was it um you know i was a professor and so i had my summers off and she was uh working in education and after school programs. So she had her summer off if she wanted to. And uh, when we got back, um, you know, there was this whole like reckoning of like, what are you going to do with your life now? So, um, you know, now that you know what you know, how do you, how do you go forward? And so we decided to buy this like little chunk of land uh, where we currently live in rural uh, Western New York. And, um, and then, that's, you know, so my art practice at that point in time sort of shifted from making stuff for galleries to building structures for, um, you know, sustainable and self-sufficient living. And the idea at the time was I had always been kind of pursuing beauty in these difficult situations in my sculpture and in my, um, you know, in my artwork in general. And then um, I decided to shift that kind of mentality to decisions that I was making with life. So. Um, we wound up um, that summer uh, conceiving a, a son, and um, he was born home birth uh, that that winter. We started building this yurt that was, you know, was going to be where we lived on the land. And over the course of the next couple of years, we built it, and then have added on to it. You know, I you know if this is being recorded, but uh, you know, this is the part of the structure that we've built that we're living in, all hand built at this point. And um, and then through that. Uh, a lot of interesting things happen in terms of jobs. So, you know, you're an artist because you're an art professor, um, you know, no matter what, in theory, you know, I'm being somewhat sarcastic with that. And then uh, they closed the art program down at SUNY Geneseo. So um, I, at the time, had been really active in uh, doing sustainability work uh, on campus and activism. At the time, uh, we were pushing to prevent hydrofracking from coming into New York State. And... Um, I wound up sort of shifting into this position that I currently occupy now, which is uh, director of sustainability for the college. So, you know, art um, professor gigs are, are kind of luxurious in a way in that you are forced to make art, you know, for tenure and promotion and those, those sorts of things. And so you have this kind of like badge that you can wear of like, well, I'm going to the studio now because I have to. And, um, you know, and, and, and so that, that's a, I, you know, retrospect that's a luxury so um so then i had to start to deal with what does it mean to be an artist without an art job without a professor gig uh and and also an artist that's not interested in selling their work 
not super interested in selling their work and also doesn't have a professor job and also is dedicated to building this structure, um, there's a lot of soul, soul searching associated with that. So we've been doing this now. I don't know, I guess we've been living here permanently for over 10 years. You know, in the beginning, we were living in an apartment and kind of building this place. Um, and in that time, I've sort of settled back into an understanding of what that means. Like, I don't really care that much about getting my name out there as an artist anymore, but I make way more than I used to. And uh, in, in, in building this place, um, you know, those divisions between, um, you know, architect, artist, sculptor, uh, you know, someone who does drawing, some a painter, th those, those lines don't really matter that much because those are constructs that exist for higher education in a lot of ways at this point. And, I, and so, you know, that was the sort of thing where whatever I wanted to do, I just did. Um, and, and so the, the piece for the show is this drawing that um, is a response to uh, tearing down the single wide trailer uh, on our property. Um, and so, you know, it was this, this thing that was here, this kind of like recent artifact um, uh, of uh, rural poverty in, in New York. And um, I had to deal with it. And in dealing with it, wound up kind of stumbling upon a lot of really interesting and sometimes really sad and, and beautiful sort of things. And that drawing is kind of a compilation of that sort of stuff. So um, I don't know, I mentioned at the beginning that, you know, I, I, I gotten to where I'm at by kind of stumbling through things. And I think I maybe stumbled through that narrative as well, but uh, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. And <laughs> we, Ronald Gonzalez is has made it. He's here. How's your sound? Oh, can you hear me? Yes. I had you on mute because it was uh Yeah, I apologize. I was in my studio and I came in the house to do something. I thought, oh my God. <laughs> and I ran up here and I'm I'm fortunately I'm on here. So I really, I apologize to all of you for being late. Uh, no. so well, what we we've just done is introduce each yourselves to your audiences. And uh, so just tell us a little bit about your background and how draw drawing relates to your primary work as a, as a sculptor. Um, well, okay. Um, well, I I'm, I'm, grew up in Binghamton, New York. And that's why I, I, I've lived here my whole life and I'm still here. Uh, I have started making sculpture uh, well, I started just making things basically as a kid, things that I found in the streets, that kind of thing. I uh, made my own play things, and uh, uh, I was mostly fascinated with little tiny things, and um, that's something that has never really left me. I've always continued to do that with little objects and so on. But uh, I moved into sculpture sort of a little bit later in life, um, maybe in my early 20s, something like that. Um, also, I was kind of interested in religious statuary. I was an altar boy, and I, so I had that kind of background and that whole sort of metaphysical uh, world, that invisible world, you know, with, with statues and that whole area. Uh, something left me bewildered and kind of, um, you know, uh, you know, in that in that place where I never I, I never knew what art was or anything like that. I, I sort of came to that a little bit later on. Um, in my 20s, like I said, and I just started making stuff on my own. Uh, I didn't really know much about the art world and so on, and uh, I um, kind of came into college. I, I'm jumping around here, but uh, it's just the way my mind works. I, came, I kind of came into uh, university in my late 20s, I think just as a, as a matriculating student, just trying to use the studios to make my own work. I didn't really care about it college so much. Uh, I was a kind of I was really a high school dropout, actually. A uh, street kid, basically. Um, and then somehow in a roundabout way, I ended up getting a, a bachelor's degree. It took me a while, and I ended up getting a bachelor's degree and uh, just went back to whatever I was doing back then, so waiting on tables, that kind of make thing, and making my work. Um, I've always worked a lot, very productive, uh, and so on. Um, yeah, I don't want to just run out about my life. I, I never really drew. Drawing was never something that was in my life very much. I mean, I don't think I know how to draw now. I mean, I could take a stick and draw on the dirt, that kind of thing. I mean, I don't really know drawing as such. And uh, uh, I had to teach a drawing course. Actually, I'm, I teach in the university now. And, and uh, last year, I've 
and I was horrified. I didn't really know what I was going to do. And, and as a matter of fact, I, I didn't really know how to teach anybody to draw. I, I showed them a lot of stuff, and uh, I, I did these, uh, you know, things on the computer and showed them all kinds of things, but I don't think they really, you know, got so much out of that. I mean, I, I thought I was giving them a whole bunch, and then they just, you know, they, they wanted to just learn some little technique or something, and, um, you know, that was a kind of shock for me with, with drawing, really. Uh, anyway, uh, I the drawings that I have in the show, let me slow down a minute. The drawings I have in the show are just made from carbon from my acetylene tanks, which is just, uh, you know, the welding gas. And, uh, you know, it's something that, and, and, and it's really an extension of my sculpture. I, I, I usually, uh, when I do things on paper, it's usually with burned wax, which I used to use on my sculpture all the time. I put that on paper, and it's a whole beautiful world that can open up. I usually burn the paper, take, spray it with water, and back and forth. I really like sort of things that are uh, very, very ephemeral, and, and they have that sense of a degradation, that sort of feel to them. Uh, the carbon is a little bit different. It's just that straight black, velvety, um, rich quality about the, the – it's just the quality of the black that um, – that I, I really like on the paper. It was just such a deep, um, you know, thick black. And, and that, at, at the same time, it was vaporous and you could get these little sort of areas and just opened up such a beautiful world. The problem with it is that if you touch it, it ruins immediately. Even, and then it, even the dust lands on it. So it was sort of like, you know, unless you frame it immediately. And so, you know, the things that I have I have a bunch of these, but I had to frame them right away. I had to cover them with something and bring them to the framer and literally just frame them. And and the problem with that is that you want to be more ambitious. You want to lar work larger and that kind of thing. And um, But that opens up all those practical concerns about having to frame stuff and just the expense of that. And uh, so I, I, I would do a little bit of that kind of drawing, and then I would just put it away and go back to sculpture because I didn't, I didn't really have the room for it in my studio, and then it was so impractical to try to build up a body of drawings that way. Although I think it's a really interesting area, and it's a you know a beautiful way of work. Um, drawing is something that is always something I want to do, but I never get to, I never get there for some reason. I can't put sculpture down long enough to do it. Uh, I want to do it. I've I thought about applying to residencies where I just draw, but I never do it. You know, I'm always too busy working in my studio on sculpture. Um, you must know that feeling. Um, and uh, you know, I uh, you know I regret it. I, I wish I could do more of it. And in some ways, I mean, I I don't know if I would even pursue this anymore. I, I like to, I've been doing a lot of collages out of burnt paper, but they have some technical problems too. But I really like the beauty of layering. Uh, the materials in certain ways and uh, just a certain quality of, uh, you know, of what takes place on paper. But um, anyway, I feel like I'm just jumping around here. Maybe, you know, you might make one to ask me something that's fine. But, uh, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. So um, I have some additional questions and I think, you know, and I've, you know, formed these from a uh, reading your statements that you've written about drawing and for um and i know uh dan's work i think pretty well his process <laughs> sort of and um so uh i'm gonna use some language and then i would like to maybe you know i'll ask you to explain further okay about what your what your meaning is um so i have um and some of you use the same language so you might just sort of have a conversation between yourselves even so like valeria you know she talks about problem solving i think that's drawing for a lot of people is like solving a problem but um, I also like this idea of being able to explore without commitment, you know, which he notes. And then um, Alan talks about uh, the accumulation or accretion of stuff on the pa on paper. And so let's start there with those two things about 
being able, feeling non, you know, being able to be free to not commit to anything mm -hmm. as you move forward in whatever project and the buildup, the accretion of material on paper. Uh, does anybody, you know, have a real uh, feeling about, can interpret that for themselves, those ideas? I'll say a few things, if you don't mind. Um, I, I guess at the time when I was in undergraduate school, my, my professors really emphasized mark making and just kind of the joy of mark making and the expressive quality of mark making. Um, I also taught drawing uh, when I didn't think I would be teaching drawing. So um, I tried to, to you know, do that a lot of that with my students. It was not the curriculum that had been um, around at Nazareth College. I mean, basically there was a lot of technique and observation and very representational drawing. And I was having my students do a lot more experimental work because I, I love that. Even though my work then gets, I think, way too tight when I start drawing myself. So what's in the show is illustrative in a lot of ways, um, but I hope that there is still an expressive quality to the line and to the marks. But when I um, talked to Cynthia, I decided not to put in the collage work, which I have a lot more fun with. <laughs> it's a lot freer and that accumulation of materials and being able to use any materials. And I've figured out how to glue things and sew things and tie things onto a two-dimensional, somewhat two-dimensional surface. And I tend to do that anyway. If I start working 2D, I tend to want to pull off of that 2D surface and make it more 3D. Uh, when I, I talked to Cynthia, we decided, you know, if, if I was doing some traditional media, uh, drawing media to go on and put those in rather than the less traditional collage work. But um, so that, I don't know, just some comments related to what you said. I think the disposability thing is very important. I, I always think that when I, if I can get a student to fail in their drawing and get to a point where they're ready to throw it out, um, I always think that's like a key moment at which I point out that you, they have nothing to lose, right? So, so you might as well dig into it in a different way or take bigger risks with it. And I, I think that, that, yeah, the disposability of something is important because it, it can liberate us. And it's funny because I'm more, I am more committed to objects than I am to drawings. Um, uh, not, not in during the process, I guess. Not, not in the end. Not having to do with the product or, or my, my goals in, in general, but but yeah, I, I I can I can wrinkle up the paper a lot easier than I can uh, you know throw the metal in the recycling bin. So and I you know my I, my own practice is built on uh, an accumulation of stuff too. So it's all about and and one of the pieces in the show the stacking the stack drawing, which is kind of the quickest drawing in the show that I, that I did, is, is really about thinking about how to, how to deal with an accumulation of stuff, which is how we do what we do. We organize things in a pile, <laughs> basically. I, I find a lot of those stacks of things in my studio. Well, I feel, well, I feel artists always collect stuff, no matter what. Especially if you're a sculptor, because something looks interesting to you, you'd be walking down the street, pick up stuff, I can use this. And I found I had to really uh, clean out a lot of things I was using. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, drawing, I don't draw a lot, but if I'm creating something or making a small piece of Marquette or something, then I will draw something to it and see if that what I can add it to the piece. I love making, like a lot of you are saying that drawing to me 
is like secondary. But I do my Marquette because they, I can always feel it and see it when I put something together smaller. And then I would take it up and look at it and then draw it and see if I can draw it the way I see it. But I always like taking paper, folding it, bending it, twisting it, uh, foam cord, making it work, trying to create the piece that's in my mind onto the piece that I'm trying to do on the table. And um, drawing have always, drawing comes and goes with me, depending on what I'm doing and how I feel about the piece I'm working on. But I think most sculptors like to get right into it and start seeing the piece grow. And as the piece grows, then we start putting things together, maybe on paper, you know, and see how that piece look on paper. But if you're a three-dimensional sculptor, an artist, you like to start working with a small piece that piece can develop to something bigger. I mean, I like to get right into it and start creating that small little piece for us to see how it's going to look, and then maybe try to sketch it out. It's, it's interesting that you say that it's secondary because it, it is in one way, and in, in another way it's not, because I think for many people, because it's part of the process, it's more important than the product, right? At least it is for me. That is, it, yeah, I, I use the drawings to get to the idea, but that's kind of important, but in the end, <laughs> in regard to the product, it's not important. So, um, one thing I do notice, I mean, this, Lynn uh, refers to a narrative in her statement, but I think that each of you engages with some kind of narrative, even if it's not literal, not figural, you know? So, like, for instance, uh, Dan, um, recently in the last faculty staff show we had, <laughs> brought it, a tree in that he had milled in, in, in a particular way. So, and in some ways, while it's, you know, literally is and was a tree, it also spoke about a bunch of other things um, that are sort of like socially relevant, right? And, in, and environmentally relevant, so a narrative so can we talk about narrative a little bit in drawing and um, and its function? You know, what do you get across? Dan, go ahead. Yeah, I think narrative is a, is a really important thing in a lot of my work. Um, and I struggle with this idea that um, I, I, I can't really quite put a finger on it, but I, I, I um, sometimes call it faking it. <laughs> so... Um, so I like the idea of, um, we were talking about like Mark making that narrative of like, how did that Mark get to this space? And that kind of tells the story. Um, so with that tree piece, it was an old Christmas tree that I had milled in half and then polished the inside of. And so it's a recognizable image that something, or a recognizable object that something else has happened to. Um, and it's completely honest. It is what it is. And then you can take away from that, you know, what, what you will, but you understand the narrative of how it got that way. And the same with like a lot of the, the um, flat pieces that I've done in the past. And in that same show, I had some panels that, that were um, drawings or, or prints, however you want to necessarily think about it. They were uh, gessoed panels that were put together over top of an explosion and then kind of, you know, unfolded to make a little bit thick. And um, those are completely honest. Like there's nothing there that wasn't there. I didn't go back and erase or edit anything. It is what it is. Um, and then that, you know, I, I, the only real, like I made all the decisions to bring it to that point and I made the decision that I was either, either a keeper or not. But other than that, that was, that was the decision making process. And there's a certain level of honesty, but also a certain level of, um, uh, lack of commitment because you can always lean back on, well, that's just what happened with the piece in the show. There is a little bit of faking it because, it was made up of a lot of different stuff that came from place. The paper itself I found in that, in that old single wide, um, you know, the, the kind of main, uh, image that goes through all five panels is literally a truss that is the whole, uh, width of that single wide trailer. Um, and the little, you know, uh, like florets that are on there are things that were keeping wall paneling on the wall. Uh, but also there was a, a patina to that space that I really liked that I tried, that I had to fake to make 
that 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 paper look the way that I want it to, or it just looks like paper. And so that's something that I really struggle with in terms of narrative is um, when I start to get in and intentionally edit the way that something looks so that it takes a viewer into a different space. Um, it's funny because I guess that's what that what most artists do. But for me, I have to really kind of like, it feels like I'm walking this balance beam of um, when is it too fake? Like when am I lying too much or something like that? Well, Ronald, um, I think there is some relationship between your drawings and I would say like some of the things Dan was just saying, you know, about, uh, well, you certainly, there is an implication of narrative in these drawings and they can go any number of directions. Can you like talk about how you see the smoke and the resulting irregularity of the form also imp implies something, you know, and, you know, mm -hmm. in some ways it's a little bit like unnerving, but then the, you know, the sort of like ethereal quality of the outer edge uh, is really engaging. So, well, this has to do, I think, a little bit with a uh, previous question and, and having to do with accident or something. I think, you know, I, I, you know I, my work is, is really that kind of intersection between, I mean, everything I've ever made even since I was little was about that, that intermediate space between the object, the found object, really, and the time-worn found object, and the fig and figuration. I mean, everything I've ever made is figurative, uh, and I don't know how to make anything else. And, and uh that that narrative is the is that is that place, and I I've always worked out of a place, and I and I get I've been making sculpture for over forty years. I feel now I'm in a place where I'm completely lost. Uh, you know, you're always in this place where you just don't know anything. It seems to me that you're just you know, um, you know, trying to open up that space uh, for for what you found. You know, to create a space for for the thing that you're trying to find. And, and it just seems like I'm always projecting myself toward that unknown constantly. Uh, the, the ephemeral quality you mentioned in the drawing, you know, that's the beauty of it. I mean, because you're just dealing with smoke in real space and it just can lay on the paper. The, the gas mask things come about because they're vaporous. And so, you know, I, I tried to play with that and tried to create that. And, that, and that's, that's um, a little bit of a, a subject that I dealt with in sculpture with gas masks and making figure things like that. So it was something that was interesting and just got that idea. But I did like the vaporous quality. And so I made a series. Those, those gas masks are a series of 12 drawings. And I wanted to make them larger and so on. But you know, you all know how that goes. And again, it just goes back to the first problem of just the practicality, wanting to frame things and build the drawings. And you know, you sort of make these choices all the time. Um, but, you know, I guess uh, the narrative, again, comes out of my life. I, I, I think my work, I'm, I'm a lifelong resident of Binghamton. All the stuff I collect is from my immediate surroundings. Uh, it's the kind of thing where you're taking things into yourself internally. You're internalizing them. And there's a, there's a, things get deformed that way because they go through you. And then you put them back out there in a way, transformed. And, and I think that narrative is something that's uh, very confusing to me because, uh, yes, my work has com everything to do with who I am. There's, it's like there's, you know, the, the object is in one way functions as part of your identity. And, and I think that, you know, you're, you're putting all the pieces back together, you know, of your life like you do every day as you wake up. I mean, I think that's part of it, what takes, takes place in the work in terms of that, that idea of a subject matter or a story or something like that because that you are getting back to, you know, yourself in some way where you're, there's, things are made in your own self-image. And I, and I do think that this very complex area, and I think it's, it has nothing to do with language, actually. But I do think that this is something that, you know, I, I work with, I make, I'm, I'm working on, I'm just I'm almost at the tail end of making these 50 heads out of found objects and cloth and so on. Uh, and I really like them. Um, but I'm not sure if anybody asked me what they were about, that kind of thing. You know, I mean, I couldn't really say. Um, but they're a beautiful series. I, I like them. 
and I know they have everything to do with me. And uh, you know, and and then, you know, and it just maybe just a little bit of a process thing that might be it's helpful. I mean, I because I just got done. <laughs> that's what I was doing in there. Is when I make a head, I, I make an armature so that the, the head is in front of me in space. I have to have it, you know, eye to eye, and everything is my height. That that things too. I'm only five feet five, so I have to have everything so I can just look directly at it, and I can work it in space and turn it. And then I sever the head and cut it off when it gets to a certain point and I weld it onto a plate and then I integrate the whole thing into the whole, you know, but I have to work on things in space that way. I have to have them sort of like an, ex uh, you know, uh, you know, a, a second part of myself out there like that right in front of me to work on. So that, that's just the way it develops. It's sort of like the energy passes through you into the objects and so on or the paper. And, and that's, you know, part of what's taking place there. That's, there's an exchange. Anyway, well, that's. I mean, I I see the narrative through each of you, but I also see, so like Valeria talks, you know, in her one of her the totem uh, drawing, which is a series of Adinka symbols that she's um, created a, a totem for, but I'm wondering about research. You know, like, um, for instance, if someone is engaged with, uh, you know, certain kind of, you know, scientific, you know, astrophysics or something, and it's not like it's literally, you know, one understands it, but it offers, you know, opportunities for interpretation beyond the science, right? So um, I wonder also if, there is this uh, that element in each of you. I think that there is. I mean, even if you're you're talking about nature, uh, African symbols, the body, Lynn, and body parts, and then we have you know an Allen in the stacked piece, but also in other some of those other drawings, there is an accretion of material that um, has to must be maybe you know come out of some kind of consideration beyond the work and and as well for uh for ronald so what is like that word research mean to you guys well i, I would, know oops sorry go ahead go ahead most most of my work if i'm doing a commission for something i have to research it and find out how to make that piece, um, um, I guess, communicate to what I'm trying to project to the people in the community. Um, when I did the um, the archway downtown, I had to research it and make sure I put all the pieces together like a puzzle to make it work. Just by any type of work I'm doing, if it's going to be a commission work, I have to research what I'm doing to make sure that it answers the questions and um, and be able to uh, do what I have to do for that for that time. Um, most I don't do like a lot of detail work. Most of my work is line drawing. I do a lot of line drawing. But um, but whenever I'm, I'm I'm doing something that I know that somebody want me to do, I research into it and make sure that what I'm doing, I'm answering the questions and and resolving what they want out of the piece. Because I'm an abstract, I just like to work in, in what I do. And I, like I do, I, I, I found things, I put them together for my pleasure. But if I'm doing something for a community or um, whatever building or whatever, I research the, what I'm trying to do for them and pull it together and we talk about it and make sure that piece what I'm creating or putting it together for them is answering the question or solving what they want. So I do a lot of research in that area, you know, to make sure that I can um, pull that together. It was always hard when I when I start doing sculpture and stuff because of a woman of color, and I had to deal with so many men, uh, um, working with a lot of men, and it was kind of tough because it's, it was kind of rough, you know. And I'm kind of quiet sometimes. I, I mean, I talk a lot, but when I'm doing something, I like to listen and hear 
put the conversation in so I can resolve it when I get home and put it together. But as a woman of color, it was really, it was really hard for me to get projects and uh, and get things done. But for my own stuff, I like doing my own sculpture. I like being creative with what I do. I enjoy what I do, but I do do research in everything I'm doing. If I'm trying to do something for a certain situation or a certain area, I research my work first. Well, research means a lot of things to different people. You know, I think that's the, the nature of that word, you know. I mean, I just finished a sabbatical, and it's for, to do your creative research, but it's a university term. And, and uh, you know, that's the, that's the only, you know, that's the first time I actually would associate that word, word with work, research and work. But I, but I do know, understand it's, a, it's a, you know, it's complex. I mean, I think that a lot of people work in different ways and that's an, you know certainly a, a sophisticated aspect to certain people and how they think about who they are and how they think about working right. and how and, and it is a means to an end but mm -hmm. i i never really uh think about my work in terms of research in any shape or form i watch in television's research i guess and i watch a lot of junk i mean because it it just you know and I've, I've been doing that since i was a little kid because it just you know, then I can go back to work. You know, if there's that, and I go back to work. I waste time. You know, I'm wasting time is research. I guess I waste time, and then I can, then I can sort of survive. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's just a, one of those things. For some people, it's very complicated. You know, you take an installation artist like Ann Hamilton, where everything's research. You know, doing these big, you know, major projects where there's, you know, um, you know having to do with the site and, and so on and, 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 and all of the significance and, how, and all the materials that are poured into that and so on. But uh, so it's a very, you know, it's, it's a, it has great range to it, you know, that kind of idea of research. Sometimes I think drawing, drawing for me is more research than sculpture is. I, I think it's, I think, I think about what I'm doing more when I'm drawing. Um, and thinking about the object and the design of the object, the relationship of the body to the object, and 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 you said this is about the bo our bodies and, and 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 all of these things that we surround ourselves with are extensions of our bodies. And and I I often while I'm drawing, it gives me a time to kind of contemplate on the details of of things that I would not have otherwise right. uh, kind of gained knowledge of. So, so, so drawing, yeah. So it's separate. I think that's a good question, and I think it, it, it relates for me anyway uh, to, to the difference between sculpture and drawing. Mm -hmm. To me, the whole idea of research comes back down to curiosity, and I think artists are curious people in a lot of ways. Uh, I think you know it's just fun to learn something new. We're interested in and seeing things, observing things, figuring out how things work. Um, sometimes I do specific research, uh, looking up images, uh, whether it's medical, whether it's the human body, or even technical, how to do things. Um, if someone hacked into my internet research, they'd go, who is this person? Because it's all over the place. Uh, and I mean, bodybuilding, not that I'm interested, believe me, in bodybuilding, but I'm interested in the bodies and I'm interested in what that culturally signifies. Um, so, you know, uh, and, and I, so it's just really curiosity and then sometimes to help me um, develop an image or to uh, work out a technique. Mm -hmm. Well, I think like, uh, for one thing, for like, Dan is sort of the anomaly here in that I consider him to be mostly conceptual in his process. But um, I think this drawing that you did for this show, um, I wonder uh, how it, um, how you how you connect that to your other other works that you do that are more um, environmental, say? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it, the beauty of 
So I'm going to, like, I guess this might sound a little smartass or whatever, but um, I have stopped worrying about how my work connects to each other. Um, Good. And the reason that, that I, like, there is a certain liberation that comes with not being a, a tenure track or tenured uh, professor um, because, you know, the, I don't have to go up to a tenure committee and explain why it makes sense. And I really don't have to have shows to continue to, like, make my you know so so it it, it uh, becomes a little bit more for me and so i guess the way that it connects to environmental stuff is in a couple of different ways and the most pragmatic way is that i deconstructed that trailer that that piece is about and that means that instead of demolishing it i took it apart piece by piece and then used the pieces for other things so the frame of it i've built a uh, big uh wagon that we haul firewood with uh i've used a bunch of it to build my daughter a tree house and um and so that all comes from my environmental practice um, that actually came out of my art practice in terms of knowing how to make and do things. I started doing these, this environmental pra uh, practice of uh, deconstruction. And then in that deconstruction process and lots of buildings, because you're not just smashing through and destroying something, there is this connection to the stuff that happened in that space before. And in that trailer, there's a lot of really weird stuff that happened. And I didn't know about some of it. I did. A, a woman froze to death outside of it. Um, th so there was a lot of like sadness and weirdness about that space, but then in it, there was this kid's room and I didn't know a kid ever even lived in that trailer. And, um, it was painted the color of that, uh, of, the, of the, uh, pink, that kind of background. And it had spray painted on the wall, uh, dream big. And, um, I worked for a couple months of a summer alone, taking that, that, uh, that trailer apart to have access to like, use it to, to do more farming and stuff on our property. Um, but it was a gut wrenching experience that I dreamt about. And I thought about constantly. And um, anyway, so that piece for me was this sort of cathartic activity of dealing with what I had seen and what I had thought about. And then the stuff that was left over that I kind of like couldn't deal with just pitching. So we rented a, a dumpster for the things that couldn't be upcycled. Um, so, you know, we have you know, a couple dozen of those trusses that I've used to build a number of different things, siding. Uh, recycled a bunch of it, but there was a dumpster that you just sort of have to throw some stuff away. And there were some things that by all logic I should throw away. I don't have space to keep it, but I just kind of had to hang on to some of it for a while. Um, and then that drawing is sort of the collection of that for me, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I see one of the interesting things about sculptors, uh, sculptors in particular, is the, the uh, the reuse of materials, taking, finding found materials, whether they're found or purchased, or they get reinterpreted all the time, re-signified as, you know, another, another thing. And um, it's just really interesting that how the drawing too can facilitate that, um, reevaluation and interpretation of material. So, well, our time is up and I wanna thank you so much for uh, spending time with us, sharing your work with the Geneseo community and globally. This exhibition sculptors drawing will open on February 10th and remain available on site till about March 10th. And this video will be posted on the gallery webpage and a link to a YouTube. So you can certainly use this video for your own, um, you know, your own work and send it to whoever you want. Mm -hmm. And uh, I certainly appreciate you being here with me today. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right.